Hi, folks, and welcome back to The Shack. This is Joe N2DI coming to you today with the LDG Z817 antenna tuner. The reason why I wanted to do a review and walkthrough of the Z817 is because a few months ago, I did a review on the Elecraft T1 antenna tuner, which, by the way, is a great antenna tuner. And at the time, it was on sale from Elecraft. Someone recently commented on that video saying something like, dang it, I missed the sale. So I looked at the latest price on Elecraft's website, and I spit my coffee out. The T1 currently goes for $339.95. I think when I bought mine from Elecraft new, the price was pretty much half that. Actually, I think it was less than half that. So I wanted to let people know about a much lower cost option that I have experience with for the new hams out there. Experienced hams probably already know this antenna tuner. I've had a couple of LDG antenna tuners for quite a while. The Z817 is one of them, and I also have the Z11 Pro 2. And I've had them both for almost 10 years now, I think about nine years. And in that time, neither of them have ever failed me or let me down in any way. And to top it off, the LDG Z817 lists for $139.95 at places like Ham Radio Outlet and Gigaparts. That's $200 less than the T1. So if you're interested in finding out more about this reasonably priced antenna tuner, then let's get started. Okay, so the LDG Z817 is $200 less than the Elecraft T1. For that price, there must be a difference, right? You have to be giving up something. Well, surprisingly, you're not. The specs are almost identical. The biggest difference between the two are the size and the weight. And there's some other slight differences. So let's line up some of the major specs between the two tuners. Both tuners cover 160 meters through 6 meters. They both have limited performance at either end of the spectrum. So 160 and 6 meters are slightly harder to tune for both of these. The SWR range for both is 10 to 1, which is wide enough to tune things like random wires. The max power rating on the LDG Z817 is 20 watts for sideband, 15 watts for CW, 15 watts for FT8, and 10 watts for other digital modes and 6 meters. For the Elecraft T1, it's 20 watts for sideband and for CW, and 10 watts for AM, FM, and digital modes. They both have latching relays, which means that once they find a solution for whatever frequency you want to transmit on, the relays lock into place and they don't require any power to hold them there. So once it's tuned, both tuners are not using any power. They both happen to have interface cables for the Yaesu FT817 or 818. The LDG Z817 has SO239 connectors on the back and the T1 has BNC connectors. Both are battery powered. The LDG Z817 uses four AA batteries and the Aircraft T1 uses a single 9 volt battery. Now here's the biggest difference. The weight on the LDG is 13 ounces with the batteries. The T1 is only 5 ounces, again with the battery. Size-wise, the LDG is roughly 5 inches by 5 inches by an inch and 3 quarter thick, and the T1 is 4.5 by 2.5 by 1. So spec-wise, you can see the differences are minor. It comes down to size. The Z817 is a bit of a chunker, but it's not that bad unless you're doing soda. If soda's your thing and you're saving ounces because you're climbing mountains with it, well then the size and weight are probably going to be an issue. But if you're doing POTA or just operating portable or for field day or something like that, it's not that bad at all. I mean, I carried my FT818 with the Z817 strapped to the top of it for a long time. It's been through airports and around the world, so it's really not that bad. Ultimately, you have to decide if the difference in size and weight are worth the extra 200 bucks. Also, a lot of QRP radios now have BNC connectors on them, but you can fix that with a couple of PL259 to BNC connectors. There are only a couple of bucks, and I have quite a few of these floating around my shack in my go bags. So it's a pretty easy fix if you're BNC only. Also, it's a bit of a pain to change the batteries in the LDG. There's four screws in the bottom that you have to take out. Whereas for the Elecraft T1, you just have to pop this back apartment open. I mean, to pop batteries into this 817 only takes a couple minutes, but you still have to carry around the screwdriver. So that's kind of annoying. I also want to mention that I've used this tuner with random wires, delta loops, non-resonant verticals, shortened dipoles, and to touch up the band edges of resonant antennas. 
and I never encountered a situation where it didn't work. I mean, there were times where it didn't work because I did something stupid like forgetting to connect the counterpoise or the antenna or something dumb like that. But under normal circumstances, it always just worked. Now, does that mean it will always work? I, you know, no. No, I mean, there could be a combination of terrain or antenna or something that just causes the SWR range to be too far outside the tuner's range. I haven't run into that, but that doesn't mean that that's not a possible situation. I mean, as long as you're not doing something crazy like, I don't know, loading up a pair of lawn chairs as a dipole or something, it'll probably just work fine. Okay, let's get into the interface. How hard is it to use? Well, it's actually pretty simple. You have a tune button and two LEDs. The left LED is green and labeled SWR, and the right one is red and labeled tuning. The button responds to short presses, long presses, and really long presses. Let me explain. So to toggle bypass, you short press the tune button. When you short press it, the green LED blinks three times when it's bypassed, and it blinks once if it's in line. To tune, you long press the button until the tuning light comes on. Now, if you're using the ASU FT817 or 818 and you have the interface cable, then you don't need to do anything else because the tuner will switch the FT817 or 818 into packet mode and it'll start transmitting and tuning. If you're using any other radio or if you're using the FT817 or 818 without the interface cable, then you have to transmit a carrier until the tuning cycle completes. So that means after you press the tune button, you have to key down or transmit something like FM or AM and you have to keep transmitting until the tune cycle completes. Now let me mention that if you long press until the red tuning LED comes on, then you'll be tuning from memory. Meaning that if the tuner already has found a solution for that frequency, it'll just recall that from memory to speed things up. If you want to ignore the memory, you can initiate a full tuning cycle from scratch by long pressing the button and keep holding it until the red LED comes on and then eventually turns off. So if you stop pressing when the LED just comes on, you're tuning from memory. But if you hold it down until the light goes out, then you'll be doing a full tuning cycle. So let me demonstrate. I'm going to press and hold and watch the red tuning LED. It comes on, and then it goes out. And now we're tuned up. Now to tune from memory, I'm just going to press the tune button until the tuning light comes on, and then send the carry again, and it'll tune from memory. and that was recalling memory. Now, when would you want to do a full tuning cycle? Well, if you've changed antennas or you've moved locations, like if you're portable, or you change your coax or something else that would impact your SWR, then for the first time you use a frequency, you're gonna to want to initiate a complete tuning cycle. Also, if you just don't get a good match for some reason, like it starts to rain or something weird happens with your antenna, you could just do a full tuning cycle. Chances are, if it worked before and it stops working for some reason and nothing crazies happen, like your antenna hasn't fallen down or something like that, you could just do a full tuning cycle and, and chances are it'll just match better. But on the other hand, if you're in your shack using the same antenna day after day, then you could just tune from memory. Now once it completes its tuning cycle, the red LED will go out and the Z817 will signal a result of the tuning cycle to you in a few ways. If the red LED goes out and the green SWR LED comes on, that means that your SWR is 1.5 or better. If the red LED goes out and the green SWR LED blinks five times, then you have an SWR between 1.5 and 3. And if both the red LED and the green LED go out, the SWR is greater than 3. It can also blink you some error codes with the red LED. If the red LED blinks four times, then it lost RF during its tuning cycle, which means that you keyed up while it was still tuning. And if the red LED blinks five times, that means that it never had an RF carrier passing through it when you hit the tune button. So it had no RF for the tuning cycle. I have to say though, like 95% of the time, you just hit the tune button and transmit the carrier and it just tunes to a good match. So let's sum up. The LDG Z817 is a great antenna tuner for the price. That's not to say that it's better than the Elecraft T1. Make no mistake, the Elecraft T1 is a great portable antenna tuner, but a $200 price difference is pretty substantial. And the performance of both of these antenna tuners is pretty much identical from my experience. Was that scientifically proven? No. I'm just a regular ham using both tuners just like most other hams would. So that's my disclaimer. But if you're a new ham and you're saving your pennies for a QRP rig and you need a tuner too, then consider the LDG Z817. It's really good for the money. I know someone will ask, if it's such a great tuner, then why do you have both? Well, longtime viewers of my channel know that, quite frankly, I've got a problem. 
I've got a problem with gear acquisition syndrome. I own a couple of QRP rigs, and each rig lives in its own kit. A bag with a battery and a CW key and an antenna tuner and all the other little things that you need. And each one of my portable antennas lives in its own bag, too. And I rotate through all my equipment. So when I want to play radio, I grab a radio bag and an antenna bag and I run out. The Z817 lives in a bag with my Yaesu FT818. In fact, it's normally strapped on top of it, with the interface cable connected. And that's kind of like a permanent fixture in my mind. Later on, I acquired other radios like the TR35, the FX4CR, and my favorite, the QMX. So for those radios, I wanted a light and compact tuner, and the T1 fit the bill. But that was back when the T1 was much more reasonably priced. So that's the story. Alrighty, folks, I hope that was helpful. As always, if you have any questions, then please ask them in the comments below, and I will respond as soon as I can. So from the Shack of Joe, November 2, Delta, India, I wish you all good health and a one-to-one -one SWR. 72. Bye-bye.